just call themselves um, the Urban Intellectuals or the Council of Youth Researchers. It's a purpose right now, today. They're advocating today about change in their communities and their schools. They have an inspiration. It's not just about being inspiring to them. It's about allowing them to be inspirational. I don't have to tell my kids to take their uh, essays to another draft or to take their, um, you know, edit their documentaries because they know they have to be tight because they're presenting those documentaries to people who are decision makers, to people who may make decisions that will change their lives and the lives of people they love. And that's the final one, this word that we don't like to use a lot in education. But it's probably the most important term when it's theorized correctly. And that's love. This is about loving kids enough to allow them to share the love they have with the world. Right now. I mean, I ask kids as young as five or six years old, if there's one thing you could change in the world, what would it be? And they always have an answer. They understand. They care. I'll talk to my students in Los Angeles and say, how many of you want your younger brothers and sisters to go through what you've been through? How many of you are willing to make sacrifices so that doesn't happen? And they all do, right? And, and, I, and I connect that to literacy education. You've got to be educated. You've got to be strong if you want to make a change. If you want to change things so that it's better for the future than in the past. And I share my own personal story with them. I said, you know, part of this is I wake up every morning, I don't want my sons to go through what I went through. So I have to be strong. It's that love, that love for the next generation that can compel you to do things that are hard. Right? So these are the core principles. Now I'm going to share some of the core practices. Right? Um, one of the things we do is work a lot with popular culture. Right? And there's a lot of reasons for it, good and bad. You know, you see the image here on the left, which was one of the first images in the, in the ad generation. You know, um, I would want my young girls to be able to deconstruct an ad like that and understand how it's positioning women in relation to men. They, they confront ads like this by the, by the millions in their lifetime. Right, so teaching popular culture is about helping them be able to deconstruct that. By the same time, on the right, you have someone like Bob Marley, who was able to use popular culture as a tool to enlighten people. Right? And so it's not an either or. Our work with popular culture does both. It's deconstructing messages, but it's also positioning young people to be powerful producers of knowledge. Right now, you can do this stuff right now. So the argument for popular culture. Um, it's relevant to the lives of you. Um, it, it involves intellectually rigorous practices. You know, I started this work at, at 23, 24 years old, following young people around, and I was amazed by how intellectually rigorous their engagement with popular culture actually was. And I thought, boy, if I could get them to bring that kind of rigor to the classroom, then we'd be in business. And it's been an 18-year journey of throwing that, that same kind of rigor to the classroom. It also helps me connections. Making connections between popular culture and academic concepts. Um, it can facilitate critical readings of the world. Um, I say that the ability to navigate popular culture for our kids is a matter of life and death. I could argue that for, for boys and girls, their inability to critically navigate popular culture ends lives. And if we want to, to end that practice, we have to facilitate these critical readings. And you can motivate to learn popular culture. So what are some of the things we do? This is a, um, a unit of critical youth media literacy um, taught in a ninth grade class in, in East Los Angeles. And the primary um, approach to this that you can tell is, is kind of getting young people to be more critical of the popular culture they consume. Um, so they engage in you know, reflective action. They discuss issues that directly relate to them. Um, we want to develop what we call the critical consumer perspective. Right? Most advertising to young people is about, about seducing them to create a consumer. Right? You're not cool unless you have these hundred dollar Jordan shoes, right? Or you're not pretty unless you look like the girl on the cover of 17 magazine. And the kids become seduced by this and, and it redefines their images of cool, their images of power. So what we want, it's not that we don't want them to be consumers, we want them to have cool clothes and all that kind of stuff, but uh, we want them to be critical about what they consume. Right? I have to understand the messages that are being sent to me right now before I can determine whether or not I agree with them. Uh, so we ask essential questions about what is the media's presentation of you, 
um, how do they frame young people? So um, analyzing cultural artifacts. We always ask, what are the values that are promoted? According to this image, what does it mean to be cool? What does it mean to have power? What does it mean to be desired? And who is marginalized or who is other? And as a member of the audience, how are you being constructed? Because you are, right? So let's just take these two images, right? Kids see all the time. Right? We'll take the one on the left. What does that image say to you as a 12-year-old girl about what it means to be a woman? What's that? I'm a loser. Okay, I'm a loser. I'm not, I don't like that, right? I don't got it going on, right? What does it mean to have it going on, according to this image? Wrong. What else? White. What else? Skinny. Skinny. All right. What is, the, what is sexy? What are the words that come in? And Seventeen Magazine is a, is a, is a magazine that's targeted to 13, 14-year-old girls, right? If that, if not younger. Right. So what are the words? Sexy, right? Do you want your 12-year-old daughter being sexy? No, right? We're, we're strong. We're as empowered, right? Um, pretty hair secrets, sexy cuts, gorgeous color, clean and shine, right? The best spring clothes for your body. Right? Young girls are exposed to thousands of these images a year. Tens of thousands. I ask them, how many images like this, still moving images, do you think that young girls are exposed to during their four minute years between four and 18? And the answer is probably a seven figure number. Right? The inability to critically consume that means, you know, they're articulating this, but not at a conscious level. They're just soaking it up in ways that are really destructive to their self-esteem in ways that lead them to do things that are very destructive. No less destructive is the image on the right. right? What does that say about what it means to be a young man? Power. Power, yes, in fact. Carry a gun at school. Carry a gun at school, that's right. What else? Okay, the bling, right? It's like, I can't, I can't find a shirt, but I'm not going to leave out my bling, right? I got my bling on my, my laundry, you know, I just couldn't find anything for, you know. So it might just say, you, you got to be swole, right? You got to be mean on it, right? You got to have bling. And that cross, which is the symbol of religion, validates that though. Yeah, so that it, it does. And then students will go into, um, we have other images, you know, that are in there, and the, the, the foul nature of the pistol out of the camera, and the students will say, that's, that's your manhood right there, is that gun. And I argue that our young boys and girls are dying over these images. They are literally dying over these images, right? So a critical media curriculum is, yeah, higher SAT scores, but it's about life and death. Right? It's about making conscious choices that I am not going to sacrifice my future over what these images can know. Nor am I going to let my friends do it, right? So that's what we talk about, about the presentation of these things, right? Um, yeah. So we have students create artifacts, and, and they basically kind of deconstruct a lot of these images, right? And what is this image just saying? Who is the target? Those questions that we have. Right? The same way we use, uh, one of the other ways we use popular culture is in spoken word poetry. So I'm just going to show a clip of one of our uh, are the videos that our students make. Because we want them to understand the ways that they can use artistic 
expression to be powerful. This is a part of our larger curriculum we call art for change. And it involves teatro, 